Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the latest HubSpot Masterclass uh, with me, Will Williamson. Morning, Amy uh, and, uh, and Emma. How are you this morning, Emma? Yes, I am good. Thank you, Will. Getting ready for Christmas. Um, <laughs> starting to feel festive. We're not quite there yet. So <laughs> how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Um, I'm in um, our, the JDR HQ with, um, in, our, in our boardroom. You'll see this big, colourful uh, print we've got behind me. Um, but I'm in a room where there's a, for some reason, there's a fly flying around. So oh, no. If, if during this, you see my eyes wandering, then that's <laughs> Um so yeah, thanks for, for for joining on another HubSpot masterclass. Um, we this is the third in our in our series now. Um, previously, we've dived into the sequences tool in Sales Hub and the tickets tool in Service Hub, and today we're going to be talking about email marketing and the lists function in the Marketing Hub and how you can get the most out of it. So we're planning to be around about thirty minutes. Um, we never know exactly how long these things are going to take because, you know, email marketing is a massive, massive topic and we can't cover absolutely everything. We can't in this session teach you how to be great copywriters, designers and so on. But we are going to give you some great tips about how to use HubSpot's tools. If you're new to HubSpot, you'll get a flavour for how it works. Uh, if you are already using it, you'll pick up some things that can help you improve your results through your email marketing. Um, I love this subject. I think email marketing is pound for pound, one of the most effective marketing strategies there is, uh, has very, very low cost and it enables you to communicate with wide numbers of people very, 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 very quickly and very effectively. Mm. Um, what we will do is uh, we're going to wrap up around about 11, but uh, Emma and I will stay on for a few minutes if there are questions. So uh, we have a, a, a chat tool. There's a, a Q&A feature as well in Zoom if you're new to Zoom. Um, so please put in your comments and questions as we go along. What we'll try and do between ourselves is to answer things uh, as questions come in, but any that we don't, we will hang around for a little to answer questions at the end and, and deal with anything that we didn't quite get to during the time. Um, so before I hand over to Emma to get into the details of, uh, of, of HubSpot and the tools and how you can get more out of them, um, as always, start with a, a very quick introduction to JDR for those of you that are new. And I know that uh, some of you here are already working with us, either on, on HubSpot onboarding or uh, in marketing services, but there's also a lot of people that are, are brand new to JDR. So. Um, we are a marketing agency. We, we're just coming up to 20 years in business. Um, started with, uh, with just three of us. There's now 36 people in the team um, and, uh, and, and growing all the time. So, um, you know, we, we've been using HubSpot and working with HubSpot since 2012. So um, the email marketing, I was thinking in preparation for today's webinar, that um, back in 2012, when we first started using HubSpot, HubSpot had about eight tools. Today, they've got I don't know how many. 800. <laughs> um, and email was one of the original features. Uh, so it's uh, it's been a part of HubSpot since the beginning. Uh, and it's one we've been using all of this time. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a, a quick overview of the agency. We, we, we work with small and medium sized businesses to help them get a be get better results from their website using a, a consistent system to grow website traffic, generate more leads, uh, increase more sales. Um, in terms of HubSpot, we have three main ways that we help uh, with HubSpot. So uh, when you invest in HubSpot, you need training and you need setup work and you need support to get going. Um, and uh, that's called onboarding. So we provide onboarding services. Um, we also provide ongoing consultancy, um, uh, HubSpot support retainers, HubSpot training services for existing HubSpot users that want to get uh, more out of the tool and want to learn how, how they can get better results from HubSpot. Um, if you would like, uh, you can arrange a free HubSpot portal review. Um, Andy from our team can get temporary access to your HubSpot account, review what you're doing and uh, point out how you can actually get more out of it. That's a free service we offer. And then we have our, our, our marketing agency services. So those of you that want to use HubSpot for marketing, but don't necessarily have the resources or know how in house. Um, and on that front, whoop, a couple of slides have just jumped there. Um, because we've got this, this, this entire team of people with different sets of skills in SEO, in ads, in email, in content, in 
web development. Um, what we're able to do is effectively give you like an outsourced marketing department, um, you know, for a, a similar cost to hiring one, just one person in house. So uh, if you'd like to know more about uh, JDR and what we do, I'm just going to hand over to Emma now to get into uh, the email side of things. Um, but I'll put a link in the chat where you can schedule a meeting with us um, if you'd like to know more about uh, us, what we do and how we can help you. So I'm going to stop my share now. Thanks, Will. I'm going to steal my share right back. Super. Can you see that all right, Will? Yep. Fantastic. So the place that I really want to start when talking about email marketing is the foundation of that, and that is lists within HubSpot. So in order to send a marketing email out to somebody through HubSpot, you have to have a list of those people. Um, you access this tool within HubSpot under contacts and then lists, and then you can create your lists from within HubSpot here. And you need a contact based list in order to send an email out to them. Lists, though, are also the place where you can really dive deep into your database and segment it so that your emails are only going to the people that you want it to go to. Email marketing is much more effective. The more personalized it is, the more relevant it is to the people that you're sending it to. So being able to really effectively kind of slice and dice your database um, so that the right emails are going to the right people, you're not sending everything to everyone is going to massively improve your results when it comes to email marketing. Just, just jump in on that point quickly. Sure. I am. Uh, I, I do interrupt on your lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, just the, the the importance of that um, is um, um, uh, yes, it's in, in terms of results, but it's also in terms of email deliverability, um, because um, uh, these platforms like Mailchimp and HubSpot and any other email service you use look at um, how how engaged your prospects are with your emails. And the better your open rates and click rates, the higher your delivery rates and the higher your email sending trust score is. And um, they're one of the biggest things that can tank that and cause complaints, unsubscribes, spam, uh, spam uh, complaints, spam reports, uh, is when you're sending emails to people that aren't relevant. And so using lists to segment your contacts means that you're able to send information that's relevant to people and only to the relevant people. And that means that your open rates go up, your click rates go up, your engagement rates go up, and your overall email sender scores go up and uh, you have better email marketing as a result. Yeah, 100%. So if that's sounding like something that um, you're wanting to dive into a little bit more, where I want to go next is looking at some specific ideas of different segmentation you could do. Now, this is going to vary for every individual that's on this um, that's on this webinar today, but there are some kind of things that HubSpot allows you to do within these lists using the fact that it's connected up to your website, that it's got all of your database in there, that kind of joined up sales and marketing. That means you can get very, very granular in your targeting. So I just want to share a couple of ideas of things that I have seen work really well um, for us and for our clients in the past. So the first one of those is segmenting based on specific page views. So for instance, you could create a list of everybody that has viewed a specific service page and then send them an email about that individual service. Or you could create a list of everybody that has viewed perhaps your book a demo page or one of your bottom of the funnel offer pages and then send them much more salesy kind of focused email, pushing them to take that next step. You can do this really easily within the filters. Um, I've just shown that here um, where you can do page views of URLs either equal to. You can also do containing um, containing certain words. So if you have a ton of blogs on your site about a topic and you want to capture everyone that's viewed any one of those things, you can pull all of those people into a list and get a really segmented list of people based on their actual behavior on your site because HubSpot's tracking all of that. This is a great way to make use of that data there. The other um, way I really like to segment people, um, which is based on a little bit more of a kind of opting into specific things, is based on specific form submissions. So on our website, we have tons and tons of forms um, of people that um, are downloading certain guides or anything like that. That's how they're kind of getting into the system. Originally, you can then segment based on um, 
which form they have filled out. So maybe you want to send something different to someone if they have downloaded a guide on one topic as opposed to another, or you want to segment based on whether they've downloaded something top of the funnel or bottom of the funnel. So you can get really, really granular again with that and making sure that people are signing up for things and you're sending them relevant content off the back of that is a great way to, like Will said at the start, boost that deliverability and, and relevancy of your emails there. The final way that um, works really well in terms of segmenting is very specific properties. So if you are using HubSpot as your CRM system as well, and your salespeople are updating um, properties about people, they're inputting information into the system actively, this can be super, super custom to your business as well, because you can have custom fields within HubSpot. Anything that you want to be able to track about people, whether that's product of interest, favorite colors, we've got in this example or anything else, you can create that as a custom property. And as long as you're inputting that information into HubSpot, you can then segment off the back of that moving forwards. So that's going to be um, a really great way of making this much more specific to your company um, and using these kind of custom properties and custom bits of information that you're you're tracking about people that what I love about um, using, using this kind of filtering is um, when you start combining these things mm. as well. So with, with the list tool, what you're able to do is to use and and or logic. Um, so if you want to send a email out that you know will be only relevant to people that have a, you know, from a particular um, type of customer, um, mm. You can create a list of people who either match the right job title or have looked at that product or service before on your website or have filled out a form. And uh, you can put all of those people into one list by saying people that meet this criteria or this criteria, mm. this criteria, or narrowing it down by people who've done this and this and this and this. And then you've got a really narrow set as well. So yeah. uh, when you when you when you start combining and layering these different um, filtering uh, methods in, you can get really, really highly relevant lists. Yeah, absolutely. Super. So once you have built out your list of people um, that you are wanting to send an email out to, the next thing that you need to do is to make them marketing contacts. And this is a question that I get from people all the time on how how this works, what this means is weird terminology within HubSpot that actually is is straightforward when you know what it's talking about. So anybody that you want to send an email to needs to be a marketing contact. And if you're on a start or above subscription on Marketing Hub in HubSpot, um, you have a limit for those, which kind of scales based on which package you are on on HubSpot. And if you go over that, then HubSpot will charge you for it. However, you can have unlimited, it says marketing contacts there, I mean, non-marketing contacts, you can have an unlimited amount of contacts that are not marketing. So before you send an email to someone, they have to be tagged as a marketing contact. So in order to do that, all you need to do is on your list, I'm just using our staff list here, you will go into your list once you've created it, put your filters down here, and just tick this tick box to select everybody, make sure you've selected your whole list there. Then just on more here, you're going to set them as marketing contacts. Um, these ones are all already marketing because we make sure everybody internal has got them. But if they're not, it will then come up and you can then choose to set all of those people as marketing contacts. Um, so really important to remember to do that before you send an email out to anybody. Um, and that will then allow you to um, actually get that email sent to them now. We've got so, a question. Well, do we want to pause for some questions or shall we um, shall we move on to look at the email marketing tool? Um, so the, I'll just just to address because we've got we got a four four questions in. I think some of these um, we will uh, come back to at 11 if you're OK to, to hang on. Sure. Right? There's some questions about how you actually get email addresses from HubSpot in the first place, how it tracks, uh, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, if, if uh, those of you that have asked questions, if you're okay to hang on in 15 minutes, then uh, we'll, we'll go through all of those. And yeah. thank, uh, thanks for putting them in. Perfect. Yeah, we're, we're not ignoring you guys. We will come back to you. <laughs> Super. Okay, so you have got your list. Um, you have made them all marketing contacts. You're ready now to actually create your email within HubSpot. To get to that, just under marketing, and then email, 
and you can create your emails from within there. So there's a couple of things that we have learned through the years doing email marketing for ourselves and for our clients that are kind of best practices. Um, and we're just going to run through a couple of those with you guys now. So the first one is personalization. And this is really powerful within HubSpot again, because you are um, hopefully using this as a connected up marketing and sales system. You've got tons of information in there, which you can then use to really personalize these emails to people. So within HubSpot, anything that you are tracking about someone, you can use as personalization in the email. If I um, create a test email here, just to show you, um, you can do this really simply um, by using this personalized tab up here choose which object you want to use so let's say the contacts first name I can put that in here and insert um, that there and that's then going to personalize this email with their name from the research this makes a massive difference in terms of how emails are received um, one study is saying 139 percent increase in click-through rate if you're using this kind of personalization using this alongside your segmentation is going to make absolute miles of difference to how people interact with your emails because it doesn't just look like something generic it makes it a little bit more personal for them there the other thing that we love using in emails that a lot of businesses are a little bit reticent to use but that does work really really well is emojis so we all know we get hundreds of marketing emails flowing through our inbox every single day and it, it's looking a bit like this, right? But the first place that your eyes go to within this email are these two that are using emojis. So this one here and this one down here, you don't have to go overboard on this. You don't have to be putting tons of these in. You don't have to use them on every email, but for a full inbox, if there's something different like this within your subject line, it's gonna make a big difference to your open rate. So kind of benchmark average from HubSpot is around about 20% to be aiming for. Obviously, this varies industry by industry, but we've seen that including emojis can massively improve that above that kind of average point there. So it's definitely something worth playing with and worth exploring. Um, so yeah, I think that's something something to definitely consider using if it kind of fits with your, your brand there. The other thing to consider is how your email looks once people come into the actual email so there's two main ways that you can do this and two kind of differences there the first one is to do a fairly plain text email that looks like it comes from an individual um, so this is the email that pretty much everyone on here will have received inviting them to this webinar um, we do this fairly you know fairly plain text a little bit of graphics and the kind of button in there to grab attention but this looks like an email that i could have sent you one to one on the other hand, for other areas of our marketing, we would do much more graphical emails. We'll put um, graphics in, we'll put videos in, we'll make it much more of a dynamic email. And the thing to kind of consider when you're deciding if you want to go down the plain text route or the graphical route is what you want people to do as a result of this email and who you are sending it to. I would say plain text emails work well if it's a database of people that you know are going to be really interested in what you're sending, if it's going to be people that you want to take a very specific kind of single action that's where the plain text emails work great graphical ones are useful if you're doing kind of informative email if you're wanting people to actually read and engage with the whole email as opposed to just taking one action off the back of it so considering those kind of differences there and where to use the different ones there is a place for both um but kind of using them both accordingly throughout your marketing is gonna um make things much more much more effective for you as well on that point as well I always think it is really really important to have a very clear goal for your email I get a lot of emails from companies um, coming into my inbox where it's not clear what they want me to do as a result of this email I always find that we get the best results from our email marketing when we have just one thing that we're looking for that person that receives that email to do so in this previous case on this one we just want people to register for the webinar and come and join us in another one maybe we'd want them to view a blog download something view a case study something like that we just have one main goal rather than doing it in the kind of very traditional um dare i say old school newsletter kind of style where 
you're just sending them a load of information with lots of different options for them to click on. What we find is that that can dilute the message a little bit and make it harder for them to just take that action that you want them to take. So I would try to only have one, two, if you need to, kind of goals for your email and then make a really, really clear CTA or call to action that really drives people to take that action that you want them to off the back of the email. I would never send an email without a goal in mind of what I'm wanting people to do on that email because that's where you veer into the territory of sending stuff that isn't useful for people and you get your unsubscribes and that kind of thing. So just taking that step back sometimes can be can be really, really important there. Will, do you have anything to add on those best practices at all? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, um, um, yeah, the personalization topic is, is um, uh, is, is great. And you, when you, as you were showing it, Emma, um, you, you used a, um, a, a contact field first. Yeah. Um, and I think in personalization, most of the time you will be using a contact as mm. the, as the personalization, because that will have their first name or maybe their job title that you might want to include yeah. in the body of your email. Um, the other use case for that would be company information. So you could have an email template that says, um, you know, you know, we 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 know that um, you know times could be difficult in the current market for you at, and then insert their company name, mm -hmm. um, or you know, we've got lots of expertise in the insert their industry industry. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, yeah, if um, you have you have to be careful with this stuff because um, uh, it relies on you having that data in mm. in your in your HubSpot record. Um, but when effective, when done when done well, um, it will make your emails really stand out, and that person, yeah. as you say, really drives results. And it can be used. So Emma showed the the the, the power of emojis in subject lines and your subject lines are so important in getting your emails actually opened in the first place mm. and uh, one of the things that we've done a lot of tests with as well as using emojis um, is to test using personalization in subject lines where um, you know if someone uh, downloads a, or requests a guide from your website the subject can say Emma here's the guide you asked for and that's a much more personalized subject line and it leads to higher open rates so yeah, those those combination of those two of of personalization and uh, and using emojis um, mm -hmm. really increase um, the the response and engagement on your uh, on your emails. Yeah, absolutely. So with that in mind, um, we'll mention that we've done a lot of testing in our own email marketing and on the professional and above versions of marketing hubs you won't be able to do this on starter um, I know we have got a lot of starter um, hub clients that do join these um, webinars this is for professional and above but still worth being aware of nonetheless you can run a b tests on your emails so an a b test essentially you create it up here and what it allows you to do is to have two different variations of your email that send to different people. So half of your database can get one, half can get the other, or you can do like it does here and have it 25, 25, and then the winning version of those two gets sent to the remainder of your database. What this allows you to do is take these best practice tips that we have spoken about and really see which one of these are gonna work best for you, for your database, for your industry, because everybody is different. Your customers will react to email marketing in a different way to what ours will. A-B testing really allows you to gather that data um, on, on that effectively. So a couple of different things that you could kind of run these A-B tests on. Um, subject lines is a really big one. Even something as simple as testing that first name, including in the subject line versus not including it, seeing which one of those performs better for you can be a, a really great and very simple test to run. And the HubSpot tool makes it very easy to automatically kind of split your database and do that. Other things that we like to test are colors and wording on our kind of buttons and on our call to actions there. So seeing if maybe people respond better to a green button over a red button, or if they would prefer download now or download your guide. Small changes like this can make a big, a big difference in 
how well people are going to click through once they're in your email. There's a, a famous example that I, I use a lot where somebody tested um, the difference between using a comma and a full stop in an email um, and it improved their um, their click through rates by about 20% or something crazy like that. So very, very small changes can make a big difference here, but you have to know what those are for you in your industry, which is where the A-B testing can be powerful. Also testing imagery and how that works. So um, going back to the kind of plain text versus graphical, create your email in both ways and see which one works best. If you're not kind of sure which route is going to be best for this email, try both and get some data on, on how that could work for you going forwards there. And then the final one is placement within the email of various things. I know we've had a question around where where to place CTAs um, in an email. This, this fits nicely into this. Um, usually I would place a CTA higher up in an email, but again, it's something to test, see if it works better, or better kind of in the middle of the email above the fold where they're gonna see it or whether they need to read all of the content before they click it. You run a test on that, you can very clearly see which is gonna work better for you. The advice I always give on AV testing is to test one thing at a time. So either test for open rates or click-through rates. Don't do both at once. Don't change your subject line and your colors and your imagery and your placement all in one test. Pick a specific thing and have a, a goal for that test that's gonna find out one thing or another. So it's really clear to you what's having the impact and you can then take that knowledge forward in what you're doing there as well. At, at JDR, we produce um... Uh, free guides. So mm. these, are, these are PDFs um, that we create on various different topics uh, that people can sign up for and access for free on our website. And every time we do one, we send out a mail shot um, to let people know we just created this resource. It's available for free. And our goal is for people to click on that email, go to the landing page and sign up for whatever the, the PDF is. And over the years, we have uh, we've, we've tested doing quite a short email versus doing quite a long email. Um, with, with lots of links, whereas it's a short one with just one link. Uh, we tested having a static image of the guide versus having a button or having like an animated GIF that, that shows what's inside or, a, or we've tested a video. Um, we've tested uh, using a PS, we've tested different subject lines. And every time we test, we find what, what, what works best for those types of emails mm -hmm. for our particular audience. And it, it just leads to progressively getting better and better results. So the bigger the bigger your email uh, database, the, the more impact that you mm. can get testing. Um, and it, it's also worth saying that we're, we're talking here mainly in like broadcast emails, but you can also do it with automated emails that are using as part of workflows with mm. Microsoft Pro. So you can yeah. test, you can test nurture emails as well. It's a whole other subject. Another, another it one. is another whole webinar in that one, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so we are going to stick around for a bit, like we mentioned. We've had some questions come in, so we are going to kind of run through run through some of those in a moment. But for those of you that do have to jump off at 11, um, we want to say thank you for joining again. Um, it's always good to see so many people on these webinars um, and, yeah, get some really great questions from people, which we will come to. Um, if you are kind of, oh, sorry, what did you have something to say? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, well, first of all, before, before we get to 11, Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes, uh, of course. Thank you again for joining. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to find out anything more, uh, if you want to know more about HubSpot, um, go to our website, jdrgroup.co.uk, um, or just shoot Emma an email. And yeah. uh, just, um, if you reply to one of the emails you've had from Emma, um, to answer the questions you've got, uh, or point you in the right direction at the very least. Um, and if, uh, as Emma showed up on the slide there in the graphic, um, if you would like to have a chat with us about how we can help you with HubSpot or anything else, um, then you can book a, 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 an initial introductory meeting with us. I'll just pop that back in the chat again. Oh no, I won't. Um, I'll, I'll try to in a second. <laughs> um, so shall we work through these questions. These We've had questions. A few. Thank, you. Thank you so much for putting these in. Um, let's start with um, the question we had from Mark. Um, how do you get the email address of someone visiting your website? Okay. So when somebody just visits your website um, and doesn't fill out something, you're not going to have 
their email address, unfortunately. Um, GDPR, that would be a nightmare anyway, trying to kind of gather that data. So what you really need to do for that is put things on your website that are going to convert people um, and get them to fill out forms on your website. In our experience, the best way to do this is through um, downloadable content. So we have on our website, if I just load it up, tons and tons of free guides and we get hundreds and hundreds of people putting in their details and getting these guides that's a great way to um kind of gather that email information but you do have to have people <coughs> opting in um mark if that's something that you're you're interested in that's definitely something that we can we can chat about how we can how we can help get more people um coming into your database from from your website and if you don't already have it um when you so when you when you get a hubspot account whether it's a free one or a paid version, you've got some, you, HubSpot will give you a tracking code that you can install on your website. Mm -hmm. Even just by doing that, HubSpot will track anyone that fills out a form on your website and they'll go directly into HubSpot account um, yeah. uh, with their, together with their email address. So just installing the tracking code will, will track any email addresses from people that are filling out forms on your yeah. site. Already. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a question about the limit of marketing contacts. Um, yeah. Um, it depends on your package, right? It does. Yeah, you're gonna want to go into your HubSpot account and have a look um, at what your your unique limit is because it is different on different packages. Um, I can help you with how to how to kind of find that within your package if you drop me an email on that one. Um, but yeah, that is going to be case by case there. Yeah, Morning, I'm very good. Thanks. How about yourself? I don't have a. Oh, I just. I, I, I know the noise cancelling on this new there, headset actually. is not working uh, as it as it should be there. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happens, um, um, the, the, the more marketing contacts you have in your database, the higher your monthly subscription with HubSpot. Um, if you add lots more contacts, your subscription will go up accordingly, and it depends what version you've got and um, uh, as to how much that affects things. Um, Amy, yes, we are recording this, um, so uh, you will get a copy of that. Um, uh, we'll be sending it out via email after today's session. Um, what happens if you add them as a marketing contact, but they unsubscribe? Um, you've been sending emails to people who've unsubscribed, but they keep receiving them. Have you come across that, Emma, before? Sorry, I was still on mute there. Um, no, so marketing contacts and the unsubscription preferences are stored differently within HubSpot, and the unsubscription should kind of override anything else and stop you from sending to those people um, if they have kind of unsubscribed through HubSpot. So that shouldn't be happening. What I do always recommend is that anyone that unsubscribes, you also mark them as non-marketing. So you're not paying to keep them as a kind of marketing contact in your account. Um, but they definitely shouldn't be receiving emails still if they have unsubscribed. That's something that I would definitely reach out to the HubSpot support team about if that if that is happening. If you've got some examples of that, Amy, they'll be able to help you with that one there. The other thing, if you've got marketing professional, you can manage marketing contacts um, through use of automation. Yeah. So, um, uh, I've worked with a few clients where I've set up a workflow that if they have unsubscribed, it moves them as a marketing contact automatically. Mm -hmm. And um, it only it adds people as a marketing contact if they meet certain criteria automatically. So um, the, the, you can manage some of that uh, by uh, by setting up rules that, um, that, that then get automated. Yeah. Uh, Demis asked um, how to create specific okay, right, so properties. Um, yeah. And yeah. I've just put, pasted a link. So I hope that was useful, Demis, um, um, because that is, a, that is a subject we could spend a whole webinar on. It um, is indeed, yeah. <laughs> help articles should, uh, should be what you need there. In answer to Yasmin's question about where you put a CTA so, in email, okay, so, um, um, Emma answered that. There's no hard and fast rules with these things. You, you just have what works best for your particular context and audience mm. and so on but um uh, if you if you leave things right until the end um you may miss out on clicks um what i just just as a as a guide if i'm sending a, a mail shot out with a particular goal let's say i want to drive people to a blog post what i'll do is have um a uh, a link to that fairly early on and then I'll use perhaps an image link and then maybe a button link and then a PS with another link. So there's a few places where you have that, uh, that link um, in a non-repetitive way. Uh, so it just makes it easy for people to click wherever, wherever they are in reading and digesting the content. Um, yeah. We also have another question 
by Mark here, who has asked, does page view segmentation assume that your website is run by HubSpot? They use a WordPress website, so how can HubSpot know which pages have been used or content downloaded? Mark, this goes back to what we were saying about that tracking code. If that is on your site, you'll be able to do that within HubSpot and get that information. It's just a little snippet of code that you add onto your website, and it will give, give HubSpot all of that um, all of that data there that you're that you're kind of looking for in that regard. Whether it's a WordPress site, a Shopify site, a, um, you know, any, any system, once you put the HubSpot tracking page, it'll pick up yeah. page views. Uh, what's your comment about database providers like ZoomInfo? Um, so, Kevin, I've used ZoomInfo um, with some clients. Now, when you get contact, so there's an integration with HubSpot and ZoomInfo, and uh, you can pull through contacts automatically with that integration that have come been, been picked up by zoom info and passed them into hubspot and um, when they come into hubspot you won't have any data about what pages they've looked at because they, they will come in as a contact from offline sources rather than having engaged with your website um, however over time if you send them marketing emails and that person starts visiting your website and hubspot can connect the uh, the, the cookies of their website visits with your email address that you've got from Zoom Info, you could start to get that, that tracking data later down the track. Um, we've got another question from Dennis. Uh, is there another way? I'm just, I'll try and answer as many of these as I can. Uh, yeah. Jared's noisy in the background there. <laughs> is there another way to send test emails to see how it looks in the eyes of a customer? Yes, would you mind just showing that? Yeah, no problem. Let me just open up a, a dummy email to show you there. So you've got your personalization token in this one here. All you need to do is click actions up here and then preview. This is then going to preview that for you. And you can then view this as a specific contact. So let's say we want to view it as Brian. You can see that it's popped his, his name in there in that regard. So you will be able to do that as specific contacts. Um, I would always double check this with a couple of different contacts. We can see Amy's name isn't in here on this one, so I can't um, I can't show that there. Um, but yeah, this this will allow you to to do yes. that really so, nicely. That is the right way of doing it um, right. because what so um, the point Emma about emojis does it acquire equally to B two B as it does B two C? Um, yes, because you're still emailing people and human beings. Yeah, 100%. I would even say possibly more, more so. Um, B2B emails are more likely to be read on, on desktop, and I think emojis on desktop stand out even more than in a mobile inbox sometimes because you're seeing more of your emails at once. So I would absolutely say that that applies there as well. What I'd, what I'd add to that is that I think, Emma, you've got a point in that sometimes in a, with certain audiences, um, like emojis might be seen as a slightly casual and fun way to communicate. And if you've got a very serious B2B brand, it's, um, yeah, I'd agree with that. Way, um, then um, that might, the use of emojis might not be, you might not, f it might not feel right for your particular persona. Um, but in general, uh, uh, like as a, as a principle, if you can find a subtle way of using them, you, you are still emailing human beings that, no, eyes will be drawn to graphics rather than text, so um, they, they, yeah. they can work. Nick, will HubSpot correct grammatical mistakes yeah, so that you go so the personalization is correct? Now, there's a, there's, there's a simple answer and there's a more complex answer. Uh, the simple answer is no, they won't do that automatically. So that's why it's important to try and keep your database uh, up to date. Um, um, in the, the the slightly more complex answer is that uh, HubSpot has a, a hub called Operations Hub where you can set up rules to automatically capitalize names for you, and it will do that work of managing your database automatically. Um, however, when you're using personalization, there is also there's always room for things to go wrong. So um, there was a um, um, an, an old lady in um, Brighton or somewhere that received a campaigning letter um, from the Conservative Party um, a little while ago and um, she was very upset by it because it said uh, dear bleep the Tories blah 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 and what someone had obviously done is when the Conservative Party were trying to gather uh, information and get people to sign up 
to build their mailing list, someone had obviously filled out a fake address and used their name as Bleep the Tories. <laughs> So they'd used they, their, their personalization, they just inserted that as the first name in a, in a kind of a mass email. So uh, it can go wrong personalization. Yeah. It can. Yeah. You just need to use with caution um, and make sure that your sales guys know where you're using it as well if they are updating names on the database um, to avoid, avoid any situations like that, really. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, we've got time for a couple of others. So thanks for putting so many questions in. Uh, Faye has asked, can we check if we make marketing contacts and they immediately become those? And if you change them to non-marketing, um, is the next billing period before they become non-marketing? Yeah, so Faye, very close. Um, you are right. So you make someone a marketing contact, they immediately then are a marketing contact. And if you go over your tier, you'll be charged for it. If you make them a non-marketing contact, it waits until the next calendar month and then sets them to non-marketing. So let's say you had five marketing contacts left. You set five people as non-marketing and five new, and then six new people as marketing. That would then put you over your limit until the next calendar month. Um, so just be really, really aware of that when you're kind of adding people into marketing contacts um because hubspot can be um they're quite specific on it and they will they will send you an invoice once you once you go over there so it's just worth being very very conscious yeah, of that and, and keeping a real close eye on it really set up but yeah hey, as you... uh, nick has asked cta question mark stands for call to action sorry that's our that's our that's short... jargon there yeah apologies there nick uh, we've been asked if you're sending an email and and customers are non-marketing contacts, but it's a transactional email, do they get sent? Okay, so um, it will get sent as a transactional email if you have that add-on on HubSpot. Uh, there is a separate kind of add-on on HubSpot, which I believe you can only get on an enterprise level package of HubSpot that does allow you to send transactional emails without people being marketing customers. It's not a cheap add-on. If you have it, then yes, you are able to do that. If not, though, even if in your eyes it is transactional in HubSpot, it, it may not be if you're kind of sending it through that tool. So, um, yeah, we, we can help on the kind of the specifics of your situation um, there with that one working out how, how we could work that best for you. But it, it's a little bit muddy um, on that one, really, to give it an overall answer. Yeah, I, think it, I would have thought it's a relatively rare case because most people wear they would be sent a yeah. are most likely to be marketing contacts, I would have thought. But in most cases, yeah. It's more, I suppose, if you're like an e-commerce type business or something like that, that you're sending out a lot of order confirmations, that kind of thing. Um, there's there's ways that, that, that can be done. Okay. So um Katie, um, in terms of contacts who've come from uh, database providers such as Zoom Info, do they need to opt in to marketing emails before they can be contacted? So uh, this, uh, this, the, the specific question is about Zoom info, but it could be for any contacts that you manually uh, enter into HubSpot or come via another source other than via your website. Yes, That's so right. this depends how you have your GDPR settings set up within HubSpot. By default, it's not gonna automatically stop you from sending to people yeah, that haven't opted in, but you can turn on some GDPR settings where you have to have a um, legal basis to contact in order to um, then email someone. So um, I don't wanna to spend too long on this webinar getting into the ins and outs of GDPR, because again, we could be here all day on that one, um, but it, it depends on your HubSpot settings and on whether you've obtained legitimate interest from them. Um, I would say is the, the top level answer to that. Yes, certainly. From a technical perspective, the answer is yes, you can do it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, from a whether you should or not perspective is is a, a bigger question, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, Emma, we've made it through our questions. Um, we have with a minute to spare. <laughs> everyone for um, for participating and sending those questions in. We've gone along. I hope we've uh, done a good job. If you, if you have any others, then yes, yeah, just shoot Emma an email, contact us via our website. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. And really appreciate you spending your time with us this morning. Have a great Christmas. And we'll see you in the new year. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.